You're listening to a Count Out Podcast. Welcome to another edition of the Stardom Road Podcast here on the Count Out Podcast Network. I am your host, as always, Scott Edwards. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Trent Brewer. Trent, how are you on this fine day? Well, you say always, but we nearly didn't get an always, did we? For the well, past week and a half. To be fair. To be, right, to be fair. Week and a, <laughs> for the past week and a half, I have been without internet. Uh, mm-hmm. which would have made doing this podcast recording particularly difficult considering we live on the exact other sides of the world. Um, mm-hmm. So I've been kind of slumming it like someone from the 80s, you know, watching television, reading books. Um, what is this using, television what, you speak of? I, it, it feels really weird. Like I've had to watch free-to-air stuff and that is horrific. Oof. It's just the worst. Um, and like it's not even like free-to-air TV with like WWE it's just, yeah. yeah, the news and reality TV shows, which is WWE, and pointless drama stuff. So Did I'm glad have, to be like, back in the land of the living. You got, you, at least you could play, like, games and stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah. One good thing. Like, I, I think we all forget, right? Because, like, we, at least I know yourself and myself, like, the world of streaming is a beautiful thing. Right, yeah. whether it be streaming services for TV shows, movies, whatever, or of course wrestling, you know, we we use that for everything in wrestling. Like I rarely watch wrestling on TV anymore, mm. outside of like a few a show here or there per week. Otherwise, it's all streaming. Um, and I looked it up, and I was like, okay, is this like a Trent problem or is this an Australia problem? No, I learned there was an problem. Australia problem actually. Oh. Which actually, I didn't learn that. Ryan did. Ryan Knightsey of the Count Out Podcast Network. He looked it up because I told him, hey, uh, me and Trent might not have our show this week. And he was like, oh, okay. And then he looked it up. He's like, oh, it looks like there's like an actual problem. I was like, okay, cool. I mean, that makes me feel better, I guess. It was um, like partially a me problem. I can't blame everything on this uh, quote unquote fine country. Um, the modem died. It was dead. And because I live not in a big city, I don't live in Melbourne or Sydney, I had to wait longer than normal to, to receive a new one. But we didn't want to pay 300 bucks just to get one the day of from a shop. So I don't blame you there. But mm. thankfully, we're here. Yes. Thankfully, you're here. Thankfully, I could say always. That means the Stardom Road podcast didn't have to go on without one of us because that wouldn't be the Stardom Road podcast anymore. Um, It'd be the Stardom Straight and I mean, we were especially not doing this episode without you, so we were just going to have to push it off. Uh, I would have boated to Boston to record this episode, if if need be. That is such a lie. Uh, but I, pre- <laughs> I appreciate it for the, for the content. Of course, today we are talking about the one and only Jungle Kiona of very much stardom fame but of course she became very popular again over the past year when Mm -hmm. she made her return to pro wrestling did some uh dates in the u.s and then had her final match at nomads before having another surgery uh but as we do on this podcast we will be talking about her stardom career the career that got many fans of stardom behind her um she became a instant fan favorite one of the core members from especially post uh you know eo and Kyrie leaving and i think this will be a lot of fun uh one of the best tag team wrestlers in stardom history obviously you know her single success isn't as notable but i promise i'm not gonna make jokes about it 
on this mm-hmm. episode because we are we are talking about we're talking up jungle kiona letting people know because i think there's a lot of people out there who may have become fans of stardom over the past couple of years they hear this jungle kiona name right P- unfortunately certain wrestlers now are compared to jungle kiona people are probably like what does that mean so <laughs> good news for you we got a two-part episode series here for you talking about her career her best matches um and her kind of you know her her legacy mm. of sorts in stardom yeah it's, it's funny you kind of mentioned like you know people might have an idea about her now but maybe don't realize what the term means to be a jungle kiona in stardom uh and especially like if you got into stardom and really joshi wrestling the past couple of years your knowledge of what jungle kiona is is the post stardom run which obviously had a lot of fan support And I say this as one of the biggest Jungle Kiana fans out there. It wasn't a particularly impressive in-ring return. Like, it's still very clear that she was hampered to the nth degree with the attempted surgeries. Like, she, you know, she literally had to stop again so she could get another surgery because the past two on her knee didn't take. Uh, But if you saw Jungle Kiana in 2022, 2023, you might not understand what all the fuss was about. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. She's popular, but like, she doesn't seem like someone that Stardom wrestlers, uh, Stardom fans, would be clamoring all over to see. This is what this kind of episode is for. For those people who maybe didn't realize, and we're going to give you some information, going to give you some matches, and hopefully you can go back on this journey with us and realize why there was so much buzz surrounding her even after everything that's happened. Yeah, uh, like I like I said, one of the most popular wrestlers of her era in Stardom. Mm. Um, ultimately, you know, her time with the company came to a, I don't even, I'm not like going to say an unfortunate end. It just came to a pretty lame end, truthfully. Like it, it it's was just a whimper. like, yeah. And, but we're going to talk about all the good times leading hmm. up to that. And yeah. as everyone expects that listens to this, I am not leading today's episode. This is a, this is a Trent special. Uh, but I'm just here to give. I'm, gonna, I'm just here to give uh, some color commentary along the way, and, and you're also here to change your tune from the past couple of years that we've been podcasting because oh, I've been hey, on the yeah, other yeah, end of yeah. some interesting comments over the years. But I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you talking about. do, uh, uh, but yeah. <laughs> Jungle Kiona, obviously one of the, I would say one of the more well-rounded wrestlers from that era. Obviously, Scott's talking about her tag team career. One of the most successful tag wrestlers. She's mm. technically third all time in Goddess of Stardom tag reigns, and if you're counting successful defenses in there, she actually jumps up to the you know top three because there's four people that share three reigns with the title, uh, but Kyrie only managed to defend it three times in three reigns, um, <laughs> which I, I laugh, but that's also the amount of successful defenses Jungle had with the Artists of Stardom Championships. So. Look, especially back then, the tag and the artist titles, it wasn't unusual to see them kind of bounce around quite a bit. Uh, unlike now, where the artist title especially is like a, it's a, it's a rock. It, you, they don't, it doesn't get passed around quite like it did back then. But um, no. Jungle just really made her mark as someone that you could bank on. And what I, you know, when talking to a few people, and they sort of say, hey, who is Jungle Kiona? How, what do you compare her to? The easiest comparison for me is to compare her to Tomohiro Ishii, both in terms of like position on the card, uh, in-ring style, really, and also just kind of the fact that fans really got behind them as an underdog. Uh, and just that was kind of the persona and personality behind who she was. Um, came in at the end of 2015 and for really five years, like she's been, she was in the company six years, but the last year was basically her on the shelf having surgeries. For five years, she etched in a very strong niche. Early on, she was one of the few true power wrestlers in stardom. As more of those came in, she kind of became the benchmark for the power wrestlers to compare themselves up against. And even though she doesn't have the biggest legacy in terms of title success, I think you can go back and look at her in-ring career, both as a tag wrestler and a single wrestler, and it's just stocked full of fantastic matches. Matches that kind of were putting stardom on the map a little bit, and we will talk about one match in particular that even got Dave Meltzer's uh, attention before Bushi Road, before he was watching and ranking them semi-religiously. There's a lot to love about Jungle Kiona, not just because I'm biased, 
Uh, hopefully, if you're a little unsure, we can convert you on that as well. I did everything in my power not to make a comment on the jungle and Ishi thing. I really did, because if you know me, you know how much I love to make comments about both of them. Yeah. However, it's a great comparison in all truth. It is, and as much as I'm a big fan of Jungle Kenna, I can acknowledge that you know, on the scorecard, she didn't necessarily get 10s all the time in terms of bit win and losses. But as Ishii proves, that doesn't always matter. Hey, that's an Observer Hall of Famer, Tomohiro Ishii. Yeah. Hey, you know, it's not a bad thing to be compared to, I guess. She might follow in his footsteps. I could put a lot of money on her not doing that, but okay. Uh, but yeah, let's get into the journey and career of Jungle outside of comparing her to Tomohiro Ishii. So Jungle Kiona debuted in November of 15, 2000. Yeah, November 15, 2015, uh, and I think it's worth mentioning, especially coming out of the Utami Hashishista episode we did a couple of weeks back, she came in after three months of training. So when we were talking about the average of six, some people take nine or a year, Utami was impressive with four, Jungle's gone and busted that. She came in with just three months of experience. Comes in, wins her first match against Momo Watanabe, which would not become a trend, um, <laughs> and then went on to win the Stardom Rookie of the Year tournament, beating both Starlight Kid and Hiromi Mamora in the final. Do you want a fun fact, Scott? I always want fun facts, Trent. Hiromi Mamora, who made the final of the 2015 Love Rookie Hiromi. of the Year tournament, guess who she beat? Sayori Anu. Now, if you look at the history and the legacy that both of those wrestlers have, that would probably look to be an interesting decision. Um, <laughs> Hiromi hasn't quite had the same career as Sari Nu has had, um, but we love her all the same. Yes, I, we will have an episode about Hiromi. Don't you worry, Absolutely. folks. Don't you worry. That'll be another Trent-led episode, no doubt. Um, That's a, Jungle Kid that was, I just want everyone to know, that was one of the Trent's first pitches for this show. When I when I came up with it, he's like, oh, was you an episode of Hiromi Memora? I was like, that's the first thing you thought of out of every other top, out of every wrestler in history, out of every faction, every group, every moment, every tournament, Hiromi Memora is the one. And I think it's fair. I think it's fair. Yeah, and you'll see why when we do that episode. But we're saving that for a special occasion. <laughs> yeah, when we run out of ideas. Anyway, okay. <laughs> fun fact, I was there at her retirement match. Um, that's very cool. See, the, see we'll have that real life uh you know uh retrospective so i think that's great yeah um and i think it's it's fun to look at jungle kiana when she came in to stardom in 2015 2016 she took the jungle name to heart um if you haven't seen her sort of debut era gear i strongly recommend doing it because it's leaning into the gimmick like anything she's got the giant leaves around the sort of the the trunks uh, she's wearing a, a like a vine crown. She's carrying a giant mallet. It's it's not the most flattering <laughs> look necessarily. It, it it doesn't stack up to the Stardom Rookie Gear of 2023, uh, but it is certainly an endearing look. That reminds me of. Uh, do you have you ever seen like the Becky Lynch debut? Oh, with uh, the, the she, dancing Irish. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why that's the first thing I thought of when you just explained that, but it hundred percent is. Maybe it's because it like plays a little bit too on the person or the character name or yeah, something. Yeah, you, like you that. have one thing that defines you. Let's beat it into the book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and the jungle thing for those who may be confused because there's not a lot of jungles in central Japan, at least. Um, the jungle gimmick comes from her pre-stardom days. She spent a couple of years in Senegal uh, teaching physical education as part of like a volunteer group. Um, and she come to love the country, love the experience so much that when she came back into Japan and eventually joined stardom as a wrestler, that kind of formed the, the look and the gimmick. So she mm -hmm. came in Jungle Heavy, the name, the music was Jungle Inspired. As she moved into her next set of gear, she uh, adopted the Senegalese colours quite a bit, and that followed her for most of her career. You see mm -hmm. she kind of moves away from that a little bit once she joins Tokyo Cyber Squad, but that formed the crux of the character quite heavily. Um, and that journey, I think, is very important to who she becomes even backstage in stardom because she joins the company at 24, which is, I don't want to say on the older side necessarily when it comes to Joshi debuting and stuff because 24 is still quite young in the, the realm of the real world. But when you're 
joining and your first matches against a high schooler and your future matches are against middle schoolers, uh, it does mean you kind of take on a bit more of a motherly role, especially when stardom in that period didn't have as many older wrestlers on the roster, people who had that real life experience. 2023, we have your Shuri's, your Mayu's, your Tam's, your Mina's. But back then, you didn't have that quite as much. So someone like Jungle, even though, you know, in the first couple of years, she's still, you know, mid-20s, she took on a bit of a, a motherly role with that life experience. Yeah, we don't have, any, uh, we don't have many uh, comparisons to that now. Um, mm. I guess your best comparison would be like a Lady C who came in older um a bit but even then it's like like you said the roster is so much different from what it was back then that she did have to take on kind of motherly leadership type role even as a rookie yeah and and it's it's sort of interesting if if any of you have seen it uh she talks about it on the uh vice episode of the wrestlers they do a special on stardom specifically. The the guy sort of goes there and is talking about it a bit. And they talk to Jungle and she's kind of talking about that role she's had to take on and adopt. And obviously, like, those interviews with the wrestlers are always the most interesting part of any documentary like that because we don't get many English-led conversations and documentaries and interviews. So it is quite interesting going back to that and listening to what she has to say and that's it still that's in i think 2017 that it's recorded which gives you an idea like she'd only been in the company a couple of years this isn't her as the five-year veteran or anything she's still finding her way a little bit all of 2016 if we're being honest is kind of just letting her grow and adapt as a wrestler they don't put too much pressure on her too early um but you can definitely see there's uh, excitement and belief that she's someone that they can I don't necessarily want to say build around, but like as they're seeing some of their key wrestlers like Kyrie leaving, like EO planning to leave and then leaving, I think they looked at Jungle as someone who we can get you ready for a good spot. And yeah. the benefit is they don't have to wait for her to graduate from high school to do it. I I always like to look at Jungle as a good hand almost. Mm. Right, like she's someone you can fit into any spot, and she's going to do the best she can at it. Mm. Right, mm. like you could stick her into a tag team, a trio, or you could give her a world title match, and you know she's going to put it all in to deliver. Maybe she's not going to reach the heights of certain wrestlers in those matches or so on, but it's going to be the effort and care that you look for, and. You know, I don't mean to make the comparison to today, but I have for a long time looked at Micah as that. Now, I do think Micah has taken on a different role here in 2023 mm. that's um, exceeding that for yes. sure. Like, I I think Micah is well on her way to getting a shot. Or not a shot. We know she's getting title shots. She's been getting those. But, like, a chance to actually hold one of those top titles. Mm. I do think yeah. that's coming. Um, whether that be at the end of the year or 2024 or so on. Like, I do think that's coming, but it's it's that role, right? It's that role mm. where you can be a great tag wrestler. You can be a great trios wrestler. We've seen Micah do both of those. That's what Jungle did to perfection and then steps up in those big roles, the five-star, the big matches. I just think it's such an important role on a stardom roster, whether it's as stacked as it is now or where it was back then when Jungle was starting to get those opportunities. She stepped in, she stepped up, and it worked out perfectly for her. There's a reason we're talking about her on this show. She created a legacy for herself in that company. And the crazy part is she only debuted in 2015. Mm, she mm. wasn't at it for a long time. She was out of the company, essentially, you know, 2020s, really, Right, that's when she had her final match yeah. in the company. It's a five-year run, but it's one that we all remember. That's a credit to being a good hand, but also being a wrestler who connects with people, which is something that not everyone can do. Absolutely. And I think that the connection with the fans is such an important part because there's a reason why so many people were lamenting the fact that she never won the big one. Because she had that fan base, she had that underground support within the community. And I always felt like there's a little bit of a trade-off uh, between Rossi and the, the Jungle Kiana fans in the sense that you will always, like, she will always be cycled into a big match situation. 
You know, every year she'll be cycled in maybe two times, maybe three times. And you get that big opportunity. You get that great match. And the trade-off for that is we convince ourselves into believing she actually has a shot, which makes the match itself, which makes the build-up all the more impressive, all the more important because you had that backing, you had the people believing, the people cheering on and hoping. So that when eventually their hopes were crushed, it was... It was earned almost. And then, you know, she'd cycle back out and we'd recover. We'd, we'd do our crying in the corner. And then Rossi would go, okay, let's swing it back. We got a Nagoya pay-per-view coming up. Let's run the cycle again. But it worked. And you do see wrestlers like that now. I think Micah, people may not want to hear it, but it is the, the perfect example in 2023. Someone who's got that groundswell of support the fans behind her earned through work in the ring earned through work outside of the ring in terms of character and i think that's the big thing for micah she's always been good in the ring she's really built the character work and now you see in 2023 it feels like the character is ready for it and that's what jungle had to do first couple of years were developing the character you couldn't put the i'm wearing leaves jungle <laughs> into a main event match and people yeah. get behind it but it was Absolutely. part of the progress. You learn what works, you learn learn what doesn't. 2016 was all about learning what works and what doesn't. And come 2017, you start to see those doors open for her just in the span of one month, February 2017 and March 2017. She gets several key big matches, semi-main event, two semi-main event matches in Currican Hall, which for that era of stardom was the big shows. That's the stuff you wanted to get to. Had a fantastic match against Kari Hojo for the Wondrous Stardom belt. Had a really good match with Tony Storm for the SWA belt. In between that, she main events a show in Nagoya. Of course, it's Nagoya where she's main eventing and has an absolute blinder of a tag match with her uh, Hiroya Matsumoto defeating Yoko Bito and Kari Hojo for the goddess of stardom. Yeah, this is when people talk about why Jungle is seen as a tag wrestler, even though she's had a lot of fantastic singles matches, this is one of the matches point people point to and say, this is why. It's one of my, it, it might, I'm not going to say it is, but it's one of my favorite Jungle matches. Like it's easily mm. top three. Uh, yeah. I just think it's, I think it's one of her best early showings. Like this is still early for her. And like mm. I said, it's not a long run necessarily either but it's one that i think you see the best of jungle yeah. you see the best of her you see the best of her as a tag team wrestler her and matsumoto one of the more underrated tag teams mm. of that era in wrestling not you know stardom i think it's appreciated like I, I know that team's appreciated but in wrestling it's a very underappreciated team and that match against Kairi Hojo and Yoko Bito, which we will be talking about in the second episode yes. of this series, it's one you have to watch. Yeah, look, the, the, when we were talking about, okay, we're doing the Jungle Kiona episode, we're doing one episode for the career, one episode for the matches, we barely got to discussing what we were doing, and Scott's like, we're doing that tag match. And <laughs> it was like, yeah, no, that, that's absolutely fair. We've got to yeah. talk about that match because it is this, such a pivotal... I think there's two matches in her career Yes, that are locks, and that yep. is one of the two. Yeah, that, that that was you almost didn't have to say it. It's just like, especially because we do want to focus on her tag work because it is such a key part of her character and not necessarily something we talk about a lot on Stardom Road, just the pure tag team wrestling aspect mm -hmm. to it. Um, but yeah, her, like, putting her with Hiroya Matsumoto was the perfect move. This is a young young jungle Kiona. She's still learning her way. Giving her someone like Matsumoto is kind of like the idealized version of what a jungle Kiona can be in terms of yeah. in the ring, intensity wise, character wise, was just the the perfect move. And you see that in this tag team. I'm such a big fan of Matsumoto's like mm. start and run. It's not it's you know, it's not like to the um heights of you know, even like a Satamora that we talked about previously, but it's just such a key one. And it's one that I think I remember very fondly as someone who came in post her run in stardom. Yeah. It's one that I go back and watch and there's just so many great moments. And a lot of that is with jungle and that team that they formed. Um, I think, I think jungle learned so much from her mm. and it's a lot of, and they have a lot of similarities in their skill and a lot of similarities like you said in their character um and she takes a lot of that into her biggest matches as you'll see um mm -hmm. if you watch the tag team title match first that we're talking about and then go to watch the jungle uh, the other jungle kiona matches you will really see um some matsumoto inspiration 
on it. Absolutely. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of the early jungle stuff. Like, as much as I'd love to recommend, like, I'll go back and see where she was at as a rookie. It's in that 2015, 2016 period, which Stardom World is pretty bare on. So it's difficult to say go and check this out as a recommendation because it's just not really there. I don't there. think we're ever getting that up because they run so much now. So They they just don't have time. Yeah, <laughs> um, no. But, yeah, this is like one of the – still, yeah, you're just coming out of a year really for her as a wrestler. This is a great kind of showcase moment. And also the Kyrie match uh, is another – yeah. Those, both of those matches are fantastic watches. And it's around this time that she starts to take on a certain position in the company because Team Jungle is formed at the conclusion of that tag title match. And while Team Jungle initially is the name for those two, Matsumoto and Kiona, it goes on to become like an unofficial faction. You mm-hmm. see Kari Yoniyama tagging with them a lot as Team Jungle uh, and Matsuka Tora, who becomes a very important name for the Jungle Kiona career. She comes in as well. And they're not an official, like a full-fledged faction. This is still stardom learning their way with the faction system. At this point, they have uh, Oweno Tai, they have Queen's Quest. And everyone else is just kind of happy to team with each other. But Team Jungle kind of becomes like its own separate mini thing. They don't become exclusive. You know, they tag with other wrestlers. um, But they kind of become their own little unit. And that becomes particularly important as we move past 2017 after a successful Goddess of Stardom run, after a successful Artist of Stardom run as well with Matsumoto and Yoniyama, coming into 2018 and we see the birth of like the, the realised version of Team Jungle getting away from the brilliantly and creatively named Team Jungle into Jungle Assault Nation or JAN, don't pronounce it Jan. I always pronounce it Jan, don't you worry. Uh, The least intimidating (laughs) faction name of all time. I think the factions back then are always so interesting to look at. Like you said, it Mm. was Oedo Tai and Queen's Quest, but we all say stars, right? We all say like stars was part of that original crew, Mm. um, even though they didn't. Yeah, exactly. Like the Team Jungle was unofficial, yet it became, you know, uh, not J A N. Sorry, no, <laughs> don't pronounce it Jan. And then, of course, you know, stars from Stardom Army to stars. Um, and I just think it's an interesting time in Stardom back then, you know, embracing the factions and really giving Jungle this chance to be at the head of one. Mm. It, it shows a lot of confidence in her at the time. She's still, what, two years into her career? Yep. And giving her a faction's a big deal. Like, like people will look at her reign, especially if you're on the outside looking in, and if you're just going back and be like, oh, yeah, no, she never got the title. She was never seen as a top star. You don't lead a faction and you're not seen as a top star, right? Mm. It, it it could be more like along the lines of a, like a Mina Shirakawa who got her own faction eventually, mm. but it's one that, hey, we're pushing you as a top star of this company. And at that time, it was crucial. It's asking a lot of someone fresh into their career to take on that kind of levels. And starting with Team Jungle, where you've got Matsumoto and Yoniyama to kind of give her a guiding hand, it's a very smart move to savvy veterans who know their way around the industry. And then Chucky and Natsuko Toro, who is a youngster at this stage, uh, youngster in terms of experience. Completely different human. Very different. (laughs) The the genie pants and the top ponytail look of Natsuko Tora to 2023 Tora is just like it's haunting what almost <laughs> anytime anytime I see old Tora like in a match I'll go back and watch or whatever I'm just like who are you <laughs> oh, she looks like a nice girl and then you see her now and it's like oh she hit drugs and rock and roll <laughs> And and don't get me wrong, I love what Tora has obviously become. I think she found her calling uh, oh, in the heel, the heel emperor type feel that she had initially has now, at but... Jungle's expense. Well, you know, it happens. <laughs> <Jump ahead. laughs> But yeah, so after Team Jungle, we get Jungle Assault Nation. And I think there's a couple of very important things that happen with this group. First and foremost, we see the I don't leadership. Want to end it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we see a very real sort of expectation placed on her. Like previously with uh, Yoniyama and Matsumoto, like that's a pretty safe world to be leading. Matsumoto at the time of Jungle Assault Nation was no longer working stardom 
regularly or at all. So you lose that strength aspect. Yoniyama's still there, but all of a sudden the faction, like the way it is, becomes is very important, but the faction is the weakest faction in stardom. It is Jungle Kiona, the experience of uh, Yoniyama, a growing wrestler in Natsuko Tora, but she's still kind of, uh, you would say, just above where Ruaka is in 2023. Mm. And then you get a bunch of rookies, Leo Onozaki, who obviously doesn't stick around in stardom for that long. Saya Ida, rookie Saya Ida, very young, like someone who hasn't hit the gym yet, Saya Ida. <laughs> for, yeah, from, it's, it's... for those wondering, like needing a comparison, it is what a way to tie was pr- before Starlight Kid joined the group. Yeah, I think that's a fair call. Yeah, which it's a, was led by Natsuko Tora. So <laughs> it, it's a group that is uh, nice in theory, and they do a bit with it. Like when the group forms, they get an artist of stardom run. They have a logo. They have special trios. Gear, a classic stardom nice. trope. A classic yeah, stardom oh, trope. Get those artist titles. But once you get past that, and then like the tag title run with uh, her and Tora, um, you look like you see the weaknesses of the group very yeah. clearly. You can't survive with Onazaki, Ruaka, and Saida <laughs> being formative parts of your team in 2017, 2018. It, it could be argued you could in 2023 as well, but that's I, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> You'd definitely be struggling with Onazaki, who hasn't entered the ring in quite a long time. <laughs> and honestly, Jungle as well, who's in no condition to be wrestling right now. This Yoni is... Yama and Natsukato, yeah. Um, but it's important because the way this group forms is something I can relate to very heavily. It's through rejection. During the first ever stardom draft, 2018, uh, you've got three factions working here. You've got Oedo Tai, you've got Queen's Quest, you've got Stardom Army, who become stuffs. They're making picks and stuff. So you see Starlight Kid going early. You see Hazuki uh, changing factions, which forces the artist titles to be vacated. And as you're going through, you see, like, Chiki Shibasawa get picked and Natsumi getting picked, and you're thinking, huh, I feel like there's some wrestlers that maybe should have gone ahead of them. And I think Jungle Kiona believed that too because when all the factions said, we're happy with our group, there's three wrestlers left on the outside. Jungle Kiona, Natsukatora, Kari Oniyama. Now, if you've ever played schoolyard sports and maybe weren't... Uh, athletically inclined you know the feeling everyone's kind of looking at them going ah i i I don't want them do you want them and mayu does the gracious thing of saying hey the more the merrier right which just pisses jungle right off accuses mayu of building an idol faction and basically says you don't think i'm pretty enough for your group and goes on to form jungle assault nation so the birth of that group is literally born of nobody wants us let's try and do our own thing very entertaining, by the way, because she would join Stars eventually, even <laughs> if it was for a small spell. Yes, um, it's a it's a very round trip. Uh, but I, I think it's again to the point of why people are such fans of Jungle. Mm. You're able to, you know, relate. You're able to understand her feelings. It's so much in entertainment, not just pro wrestling. It's about being able to relate to something, being able to connect to something. And if you watch this draft, of course, we talked about the 2019 draft when we were talking about the Hanukkah episode, Mm. which is, you know, the more famous of the two drafts. But, you know, the under the, the feeling of being a, you know, being cast away, being a cast, cast aside and kind of doing something about it i think is something mm. that a lot of people can like find strength in and that's what jungle kiona ultimately was for fans and i just think again that's why when you get to her biggest matches you have some of the loudest support we've seen it's it's <laughs> it's very much the reason that we are talking about her now. You know, you it's don't very... you don't you don't create a connection like that mm. by just being another wrestler. You you do it by being relatable, like I said, by being someone that people could see themselves in. It's a very fine line to walk in taking a power wrestler 
and making them a believable underdog. Mm -hmm. It's easy to take like a Rey Mysterio or, you know, a a shorter, faster wrestler, an Azumi, and kind of building them up as a bit of an underdog wrestler because you go in the ring, you see someone who can't use size, they can't use imposing aspects, which feel essential to this kind of thing. And it's easy to support them. You look at someone like Jungle Chen. Now, she's not tall, but, you know, she's built fairly strongly but she's a power wrestler that's what she goes about making that a believable underdog character and gimmick is very difficult to do well because you either nerf them and make them look weak or you make them too strong to be an underdog but by doing this kind of work in a character aspect taking someone like this and having them kind of feel every man and relatable and being hard done by by others you get this underdog character you can build up and cheer and support even as they're throwing thunderous lariats and throwing people around the ring and doing typically strong, imposing gimmick work. Um, and, yeah, working through this as Jungle, you know, as the leader of a weak faction that would, you know, kind of having to build themselves up against strong groups. Oedo Tai Queen's Quest and even Stars at this time are very strong, especially when you add Arisa Hashiki to the Stars lineup. Um and you can, they're so undermanned and underpowered that you can't help but just root for them to survive in many ways, let alone thrive. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I excuse me. <coughs> just go. Getting choked Sorry. up from the jungle experience. I understand. I, I, I just think like when it comes to Jungle Assault Nation as a whole, it's a, it's a group that, Again, I think the end is remembered more than the actual run. Mm, for sure. But making the most out of a faction of misfits, it's it's the charm that so many people actually loved with a Tokyo Cyber Squad. Mm. Right? Yeah. And it's that's a the jungle, that's assault jungle nation. effect. Definitely feels like a precursor to Tokyo Cyber Squad because to me, Tokyo Cyber Squad takes the every man, anyone's welcome, come as you are aspect of Jungle Assault Nation and combines it with the rebellious, uh, no one can tell us what to do nature of Oedo Tai. And it's very fitting that Hana Kimura grew up in the Oedo Tai system in stardom, comes over, her first pick in that draft is Jungle Kiona, who comes from the Jungle Assault Nation thing, and they literally kind of build Tokyo Cyber Squad as an amalgamation of these two concepts. And it works wonderfully. And, yeah, we will talk about that draft specifically, but I think, like, looking at the situation Jungle found her in, and she's leading a faction that's kind of doomed from the start in terms of strength, she does everything she can to carry that group. End of, like, probably the start of the five-star Grand Prix in 2018, um, and especially through to, I would say, the end of 2019. That period is Jungle Kiona at her physical in-ring best. You're getting the couple of years of experience she's had, the pressure of having to perform at a main event level as a leader, as a faction leader, and you're getting it before the injuries start to tick up and before the the uh, the miles start to take their toll on her. So this period as leader and then the initial part of Tokyo Cyber Squad is when she's at her strongest. And you get a series of matches at the start of 2019. You get the red belt match against Kagetsu, at, uh, which is in Kurokan Hall. And then you get the March 3rd match against Momo Watanabe in Nagoya for the Wonder of Stardom Championship, which for many people is the your pinnacle the peak when it comes to jungle kiana as a wrestler it's for some people it's even the peak of sardom at that time mm. truthfully uh it's yep. not just a jungle kiana thing uh so you could even say the peak of momo's reign as wonder of stardom champion of which of course was the historic reign that she had and i think mm. which we'll talk about this match more in depth uh next time but i think that those matches and those opportunities is kind of what perfectly set her up, right? For, all right, you know, we had these performances. We had these moments. Mm -hmm. We can build upon this to the eventual win down the line. 
No, of so, sorry, sorry. The the eventual. So win. of course that didn't happen. <laughs> but, I, but I think those are the types of matches we look at now from certain wrestlers, right? Um, in many ways, Suzuki versus Saya Kamatani for the Wonder of Stardom Championship felt like that moment for her, mm-hmm. you know, as the Momo did, Momo matched in for Jungle. Uh, Micah has countless matches against Utami, where I think you could feel that. Natsupoi against Mina Shirakawa this year. A lot of people felt that. It's it's those highlight moments where you can see them, you, right? You can feel them being champion. They may yep. have not got that win, but you can feel that feeling. You can understand that feeling. You could see it. You can see it in your future. Now, does it always happen? Unfortunately, with our main example which everyone uses it did not happen but it's it, it's the moments we it's the moments we uh we we appreciate and remember right right, it's, right? It's, it's, the, it's the journey not the destination yeah sure <laughs> yeah my my favorite wrestler oh it has gotten the destination she beat mercedes monet for the iwgp woman's title and then proceeded to do nothing with that. Hey, 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 that's not her fault. <laughs> so we bring ourselves to early 2019. The Jungle Assault Nation is clinging for life because they're hopelessly outgunned and they come to the next draft. Perfect. This is a chance to kind of, you know, restock the war uh, ammunitions and bring in some heavy hitters. That's what you do in these kind of draft settings. Yeah, you know, if anyone was in need of a number one draft pick, it was Jungle Assault Nation. Only it's expansion time and unlike the nba when stardom expand their factions at this time they're like no we're only having a couple of groups so hanukamura has decided to form her own group and we enter enter a five person elimination match it's a very quirky little match but basically what it means is you're working out your draft draft picks (laughs) you're working out your draft picks but the last person eliminated loses the right to have a faction Mm. Comes down to Hanukkah and Jungle Kiona. And as you can probably guess from the tone and the knowledge that Tokyo Cyber Squad becomes a thing led by Hanukkah uh, Jungle Kiona does not win in this match. It's such a great match to tell a story, though, like oh, of yeah. what ultimately happened, right? Mm-hmm. You know, Hanukkah rips away Jungle's faction. Jungle's just trying to get to the point where she can have like a fair fight, a fair f- faction behind her and ultimately she now has none at all and she would get it though she would get a fair group behind her Mm. it just happened to be not as a leader and and it's something that if you want to watch the draft right you should watch that match because Mm. you get a full-on appreciation for the jungle pick and everything about that yeah, it's it's such an important moment for the draft and the character of Jungle Kiana because the previous year, I think, as Jungle Assault Nation and having been ostracized by stars, or Maya specifically, you look at this, the Jungle Kiana that was around 2015, 16, 17. She's very loud. She's exuberant. She's in your face. You know, someone who looks like they've had too much Red Bull. As Jungle Assault Nation's coming through, she's kind of shedding that a little bit because she's taking on the leadership role. She's having to be a bit more mature and a bit more of a leader. And then with this happens and it kind of crushes her even more after one year the faction's ripped from her and she's forced to basically play second fiddle to someone else. It's kind of the growing of a uh, cynical Jungle Kiona. And you see that early on in the uh, Tokyo Cyber Squad, but you see it in the removal of the Jungle gimmick. So obviously the... The uh, the the vines and the flowers and the plant stuff got removed pretty early on, but you still had the music, had the color scheme. As you're entering Tokyo Cyber Squad, she ditches the yellow, the red, and the yellow for a pink and white attire. And the only time you get the jungle colors is in the trio's team with the face paint. She keeps the red, yellow, and green for that, but she sticks to pink otherwise. The theme song that she had, the very jungle heavy, kind of weird music, but it, it works for her. That gets removed from more kind of generic techno rock sounding thing. She's no longer shouting jungle, jungle exuberantly before matches and stuff. It's all removed and you're going from this young, hopeful, exuberant uh, optimist and just she's getting beaten down by the reality of the wrestling world and coming into Tokyo Cyber Squad 
although it would be massively important for her character and she'd arguably look happier with that group than she had in any other situation stardom, it's an interesting and fascinating character growth for someone like her. It was the right choice. You know, Tokyo Cyber Squad wasn't something that lasted long due to circumstances out of mm. anyone's control, but it is a faction that many people will fondly remember for a reason. It's because of that connection she had with Hana Kimura. It's that connection that those that top three made, mm. right, uh, between her, Kana, and Konami, and really what they were able to become within the less than a year together, pretty much. Uh, it was about a year at the end of the day but yeah. you know due to the pandemic and stuff they didn't get to be together on tv or or not tv but you get my point uh yeah. for a year but overall i think it for jungle took a lot of weight off her shoulders in the right way mm, it, mm. It, right it gave her a chance to maybe appreciate some of the moments even more because listen at the end of the day this is pro wrestling i'm not saying that she had like all this weight on her shoulders because she's the leader of a pro wrestling faction like i'm not saying that but you could feel it in just like you said in her in her expressions in her matches um and any time we got the tokyo cyber squad moments right it just ended up being so natural and I, and I just think that while ending a faction and taking leadership from someone's always tough, and it's something we rarely see anymore, truthfully. Um, we just add more factions these days. Uh, I think it is such a great story to look at, and I would like for stardom now to take something like that maybe with someone who could be struggling as a leader in their faction and put them in a group so that maybe an unnatural fit becomes the perfect fit yeah and that's the important thing because yeah jungle kiona initially with the togo cypress one theming doesn't fit but she adapts very quickly and it works perfectly because she yeah when you see her with konami and hana kimura she looks incredibly happy and relaxed and comfortable and i do think like she's come out and pretty much said that she felt more comfortable being a number two under hana in tokyo cyber squad than she did as a leader for jungle assault nation and i think at the end of the day she was better served in that kind of role as someone who had the experience of leading a faction and was able to impart that wisdom on someone like hana who was coming in who is a little bit, a lot younger, a little bit less experienced, who hasn't led the faction set up. And she was able to learn from Jungle, just like Jungle was able to learn from a Matsumoto and a Yoniyama. Now, obviously, you look at Tokyo Cyber Squad, it is actually basically uh, Jungle Assault Nation. You've got Jungle, you've got Kari Yoniyama, you've got Ruaka. Like, they're all still coming in and uh, part of this group. But it is such an important growing experience. And, yeah, for such a short faction... Uh, time-wise, Tokyo Cyber Squad instantly made themselves must-watch and instantly made themselves one of the most popular factions in stardom. And I would dare say one of the more recognised factions outside of stardom, even to this day, with years of Oedo Tai, years of Queen's Quest, the uh, impact of a Donna Del Mondo. Tokyo Cyber Squad is still, anyone who was watching wrestling around that time is kind of aware of what they were thanks to Hana Kimura, but because of that group as a whole. In Stardom's first maybe true mainstream, non-like WWE signing type scenario, right? Yeah. Like, obviously, EO and Kyrie they become mainstream because they go and sign with WWE and you hear about Stardom, where they came from. Mm. But Tokyo Cyber Squad, through Hana Kimura, and through those three especially, right? Just the look, the the camaraderie the feeling that they gave you as a fan i think that is what helped make it so popular Mm. um i just know so many people that got into stardom because of that faction and because you know everyone will say because of hana but ultimately it is because of that faction and what hana was doing with it and what those three did the fact of the matter is their actual run isn't long one no. and two the time that they have gold isn't long either 
but it just works as a, fa- a trio. Like it's just such yeah. a fun dynamic trio, and they feel so at home together. And like at the end of the day, you see how much they were connected to one another because even outside of stardom, they were inseparable in a lot of ways. Like for as much as we don't necessarily like to talk about Terrace House in this day and age because of everything that happened, when they were running stuff with Hana Kimura and she was out talking with her friends, her friends were Konami and Jungle Kiona. Like that was the very real kind of connection and friendship that they had. And you it shows so clearly in how they carry themselves as a trio in the ring, in the backstage interviews and stuff. It really just was the perfect fit and so good for someone like Jungle to be able to, you know, rest a bit easier, no longer having to lead a group of people, but just be that motherly figure for Tokyo Solver Squad. I, I like to try to make comparisons um, a lot on the show when we're talking about something old for people to kind of connect with. Mm. I can't make one for Tokyo Cyber Squad. <laughs> it's a very unique situation. It was a it was a perfect storm in many ways mm-hmm. that is unmatchable. Sure, you have the I think you can have the goofiness and the fun of it in like a stars, for example. Um, you can have the um fandom that it creates with like a cosmic angels when they came together. Uh, but ultimately, there's nothing that in such a short amount of time, I think, matched that. Mm. The only yeah. group that has gotten that popular that quick is Donna Del Mondo. But that is a completely different group in different direction and everything. So there's a lot. There's, mu- there's a, multiple feelings of Tokyo Cyber Squad within stardom. But there's nothing that has captured that. And that is a credit to the three. Hana, mm. Jungle, and Konami. The, the fact you needed all three to quite make that work. Because they all yeah. brought something different to the table. Um, so they have a very short artist run. But it is... I feel like it's way more memorable than the amount of time they had it for. Is it because of the pictures? I think, I think it's, it's the, pictures. the pictures. It's the like, pictures because it's such the full the the full gear and yeah matching. Like I think that's why it's the pictures and it's just I think the natural aura that Hunter was bringing around that time. Yeah. Anything she touched turned to gold. So that it just it made too much sense. Then you saw Jungle and Konami go on with their tag team. They won the titles. This is the strongest title run that Jungle has. Full stop. Whether it's tag run, whether it's got uh, artist run, crazy. Yeah, this is the strongest runs that she has. Goes through to the beginning of 2020 where they lose it to Jamie Hayter and B Priestley. And then the unfortunate reality happens. The pandemic hits. When they come back, Tokyo Cyber Squad is without its leader because Hana Kimura has unfortunately passed away. And Jungle, she takes an extra week to kind of deal with it all. Again, shows how close she was, closely connected with uh, Hana Kimura and that sort of group. She comes back and she becomes the de facto leader. She's keeping them going strong as best that she can. It is obvious that the faction without Hana and with everything that happened wasn't going to be able to exist without Hana. And so they do bring it to an end in October um, in a quite brutal and aggressive elimination match. Yeah, We talked about Natsu Katora kind of becoming a bit of a rival for Jungle Kiona um, over the years. It sort of starts in 2018 when they have the final of the Five Star Grand Prix, the final night, and Natsu Katora basically knocks Jungle out by beating her. There's no animosity there, but some things that she's saying in the interviews kind of gives you an impression. She's like looking to prove herself and maybe overtake Jungle when she moves to Oedo Tai, when Jungle goes to Tokyo Cyber Squad, it becomes a lot more brutal and aggressive. They're really going after each other, and it eventually leads to this uh, faction disbandment match. Loser loses their faction. Konami betrays Jungle Kiona, slams a steel chair on her head. They lose. Tokyo Cyber Squad is no more. Jungle Kiona joins Stars for precisely one day. Yeah, one day. Yes. I don't even think it was official... Like, like it was official, but at the same time, it's like, if you look in the history book, like if you look up stars and their history, I'm not sure if jungle will be in it or not. Yeah. I, I think mostly it's just, it doesn't have enough time to set because no. it, it's basically stars 
adopts everyone from Tokyo Cyber Squad. Yeah. Some of them go on to leave, some violently, some just kind of say, yeah, I'm sick of this in Rena's case. But I, I think the reason that we most easily consider them po- or consider Jungle part of stars is because of Mayu wearing the paint. Once she mm. goes out with injury, she wears yeah. the Jungle Kiona paint for ever really like mm. Mayu almost made it like just the official part of her gear because like even after jungle had left the company she still had it going um but it, it's crazy to me that you know they have the disbandment match she has one match team with Mayu after that and then it's over yep. the stardom run of jungle kion is over just like that not expected obviously not something that I'm sure either side, when you know she had to get surgery, was like, "All right, this is it." Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, you know, it's things we see happen in wrestling. Uh, it's something that we've seen happen recently. For example, in like pro wrestling wave, Nagisa Nozaki got knee inju- uh, knee mm-hmm. surgery. She was out for a long time. She ultimately ended up leaving Wave yeah. uh, by the time she was ready to come back, just because things happen. Uh, people move on. Well, no, I don't know if we'll ever get to know that full true story of why things um, had to end the way they did. Maybe we do, and I'm just an idiot. Um, but those are the one of the things I don't want to know. You know, like with so many things in Joshi, I think we're better off not knowing and better off just appreciating the times that they had, right? Mm. Jungle Kiona's run while ending unremarkably, un- ending with a whimper, like you said earlier. We're not going to remember it because of the end. We're going to remember it for the tag reigns, the uh, you know Jungle Assault Nation, Tokyo Cyber Squad, the big match with Momo Watanabe, the big title match with Mayu Iwatani even, her last huge match. Mm. Yeah. I think that's really where people see her rain, run in the company end, truthfully. She mm. was around for a few more months, but that was the, this is it. Yeah, that's the tipping off point because, you know, she has the five-star Grand Prix, but she's not the focal point of that. You've got the Oedo Tai Tokyo Cyber Squad story, but I think so many people were now focused on the next step, the next generation of wrestling, because you now had Utami winning the five star Grand Prix, waiting for that to be the air ascendancy. You had, you know, you're basically looking at who's stepping up for stardom. And I think there was kind of a realization that it's not so much that Jungle couldn't have stepped up, but you had all this new talent, all this hungry talent. And it was like, well, we're waiting for those people to step up. But yeah, yeah. Jungle had a final. Big match against Mayu Watani, first time ever. Um, those two only wrestled each other once in singles competition, which is wild to think about. And she finished her stardom career alongside Mayu Watani. And she says as much that that was important to her because the reality yeah. is she probably shouldn't have wrestled that last match. Like, you see her as soon as that match finishes, Daichi's rushing with this leg brace, which takes up the whole of her leg to yeah. put it on her. And she's in tears. She, she can barely give a promo. It's actually, I hadn't watched this uh, since it happened, but yeah. I watched it today kind of to, you know, in preparation. And it's absolutely heartbreaking, especially in no, hindsight, no. knowing what actually goes on. But like, she's trying to apologize to the audience because she looks awkward and that she wasn't able to, it was meant to be a rebirth for her, but obviously she's now having to go away. But there's, you know, it is so heartbreaking to know what happens, but I'm glad like she got to have that final match in Nagoya. Mm -hmm. That was important. And she got to have it with Mayu, which is also important because you didn't see it on screen a lot because they were in separate factions and you had the story of, you know, her going independent because Mayu maybe forgot she was there. Maybe just like, no, I don't really want you, but I don't want to make you feel bad, but it goes all the way back to jungles first months, in wrestling, not just as a performer, but just learning to wrestle because she wasn't into wrestling before she started. After she came back from Senegal, she got uh, told by a friend, oh, you should check out wrestling. It might be good for you because she didn't know what she was going to do after coming back from Senegal. And she went to a stardom show. She fell in love with it. And Mayu Watani is the inspiration for her. 
you know, when she sees what Mayu does there and in the five-star Grand Prix, that's what inspires her to wrestle. That's what keeps her training and eventually gets her to debut. So her being able to finish her stardom career next to Mayu Watani as friends, as teammates, maybe as faction mates, officially, unofficially, um, it's as as much as that moment is heartbreaking, especially in retrospect, knowing how important that was to her is it kind of makes it very bittersweet and heartwarming at the same time. Yeah, I mean you never want a wrestler's end in a big part of their in a big part of their career to happen as it did here. Mm. Um but when you look at it in the sense that like, you know, she was got to be with Mayu and you know Mayu paid tribute for months upon months upon months to her. Mm. It does make a bleak ending a lot brighter in many ways. It makes it easier to swallow, almost like easier to accept. And ultimately, I think her also just coming back to wrestling and kind of getting the send off. Because let's be honest, we sit here in you know November two thousand twenty three. There's a real chance we've seen Jungle Kiona wrestle her last match. We don't yeah. know. She's going to try to make her way back, mm. but with that knee and just all the surgeries and everything, you just never know. And it's an appreciation we can have for someone like her. It's an appreciation that I, for one, can't get with like a fan favorite for me, which is Arisa Shiki, of course. Like mm. I always compare cruel you know tough endings like that where injuries ultimately you know they they're they're, you can't you can't control them you can't predict them they're just something that they come up and you just kind of get accepted it's it's why anytime a wrestler gets hurt we all kind of just you know hope for the absolute best timing and stardom couldn't be worse for this i guess um (laughs) But, you know, everyone's starting to seemingly come back. Some of the injuries seem like it's more precaution than anything else yeah. and so on. And, and that's so- important yes. that it is precautionary because I, I want to, like, not that it's fun to talk about injuries and people suffering, but I, I want people to understand what happened to Jungle Kiona. This yeah. isn't, oh, I've tweaked my knee, I need to take time off. Yeah. So what what the situation is, I'm going to find the list because it was ridiculous. It got announced a couple of days later after this Nagoya match that she was taking time off the hill from the following. A ruptured ACL ligament in the left leg, which would require surgery. A ruptured MCL in the right leg, which didn't require surgery but would require a lot of rehab. And a dislocated right shoulder that would require surgery. She couldn't get surgery for the knee straight away because she had to get surgery for the shoulder because she needed the shoulder to be okay so she could be on crutches for the knee. And then, of course, the unfortunate thing in all of this is the initial ACL surgery didn't take. It got botched. She had to go under the knife a second time, which caused her to miss the Hanukkah Memorial Show wrestling there. She had intended to wrestle there. She could only make an appearance and do what she did there. The second surgery also didn't take. And she tried to wrestle when she came back in 2022. She tried to wrestle on it doing extensive rehab. Her... Uh, independent run her american run was hampered by that because you can see in the ring she's not 100 percent and like she's missing she's not able to take as many shows as she wants because of that and although we don't know a lot from her now she's kind of gone social media silent for the most part for her own mental health and her recovery we do know she had to go under the knife a third time to deal with that knee injury and whether she comes back to wrestle or not that's just kind of a you know living a healthy life kind of surgery situation so when you hear about stardom going through injuries um it's important to know like stardom and taking precautions here a lot of wrestlers are taking time off when years pass they probably didn't because all of these jungle counter injuries didn't happen at the nagoya show <laughs> against the wedo tie i think the acl did but all of the other injuries were carryover injuries. They were wear and tear injuries. Like we saw her come back from, I think, a broken wrist way earlier than she should have, like months earlier than she should have in a five star Grand Prix setting. And she was someone that was always particularly badly taped up. And, you know, she was working through injuries she shouldn't have been working through, and it ultimately caught up. 
So looking in high, like looking now at start of 2023, yes, everyone's been injured, but it doesn't feel like they're being pushed to work through quite as many injuries as they used to. There, there is a competitiveness amongst these performers to, mm. and this is a pro wrestling thing, which has long been, you know, some could say a good thing. Many will say a bad thing. Mm. There is a competitiveness to always, you know, on with the show, right? The show yep. must go on. And the show will always go on, which is why these wrestlers keep going out there and keep pushing their bodies to the max when they shouldn't, mm. right? And I think it's not always on the company, but it's also on the wrestler to try and go and try and right. Like uh, this was a big topic a few years ago when Cody Rhodes wrestled with the torn peck, right? We all saw it. We all mm. saw how bad it was, right? Like his, his mindset was, well, it can't get worse. Yeah. Ultimately, in an interview or in a documentary he said after, he's like, no, it could have got worse. <laughs> I'm lucky it didn't, right? Yeah. It's like things can get worse. And a lot of these wrestlers are just so – they're so competitive. They're so determined to put on a show for the fans that they keep mm -hmm. going and they keep going until they can't go any longer. And that's ultimately, I think, what we saw with Jungle is that she wanted to put it on a show for the fans. She wanted to give back to the fans for supporting her. And ultimately, the only way she wasn't going to is when her body could not do it anymore. Mm. And sadly, that's where we are in her career, is yep. that her body just can't do it. Um, hopefully, and I, I'll keep saying this, hopefully one day it can, one day the the surgeries you know they're perfect and she can get back in there and wrestle one more final match like, i'm not asking her to do a run ever again she should never do a full-time run ever again no. i'm happy she got the run that she did here in america that mm. translated to the nomad show which was this final goodbye for her essentially that's the last nomad show we got yeah. right they did it for her essentially <laughs> and well, they're raising money for her hiatus so yep that they did a show for her, and maybe that's the purpose of these things, right? Is to raise money to help. It's why when Julia had brought up that idea of, of like this this business of sorts or for retired wrestlers, it's like that's that would be great, right? It's like mm -hmm. to help them because these injuries happen, things build up. And for Jungle Kiona, while she's still so young, we we kind of Fortunately and unfortunately, get to live through it through her, right? Because she's yeah. she's been open about it, about the previous ones. Now she's off, and as she mm. should be. She should take her time away. There's no need to be on social media. It's not going to help in any way, shape, or form. Um, and truthfully, she's had the best possible career at the end of the day. She, yeah. got, to, she got to close the book if she wants that to be the ending. And I think that again, when it comes to these wrestlers and all those injuries that Trent just talked about the first time around, we should be happy that it ended the way that it did. Yeah, unfortunately, athletes are the worst people to ask, Are you okay? Can you yeah. keep going? Because the answer is always yes. We saw it with Nat's point. She wanted to keep going, and you know, she basically had to be told by everyone, You need to take time off. Hell, I'm not an athlete, and I went to play basketball on a broken wrist, and I'm like, I think I can make this work. Yep. Spoiler, I, I, I couldn't make it work. It's um, something we all do. You're sick, yeah. you're you're hurt, you're you just you're so competitive, you think you can keep going, and then ultimately you, you hit a wall that you can't get past and you gotta get yourself better. Mm. And it it's why it's why we celebrate the returns of injuries as much as we do, because it's like we know they're okay for the most yeah. part unless they rush back, which is something that again the athlete, the competitiveness, that is something you can't stop with certain people. Mm. Um, it, it's its fitting that we are recording this on the day that Saya Kamatani and Tommy Heishishta return from injury. Two very different injuries, one a freak accident, the other overall buildup, right, yeah. for one of them. Together they make one jungle counter injury <laughs> that forces her to stop and that furthers the point, right? They were yeah. only gone for a handful of months. Mm. Jungle Kiona was gone for a year plus. And yeah, a year and a half. 
Uh, but yeah, it's obviously it. The career ended the way nobody would want it to. But the career itself, for all of our jokes about, oh, she didn't win the singles title. Oh, she never cracked the top. It is a career that's worthy to look back on. It's a career that is earned as like some of respect. Like you can look back and say she had a hell of a run for five years slash six. Uh, she put on some tremendous matches. She was a fantastic character. And the fact that we're sitting here in 2023, years after her, the focus of her, you know, the prime of her career, when she was quote unquote relevant. And people are still not just me. There are people outside of it than just me who just adore her as a person and a character and as a wrestler and just want to see the best for her and want to go back and look at the matches. It just speaks to how important she was to stardom around that time. As you mentioned at the start, she's one of the more memorable wrestlers from that era, and it's a very important era. You know, it's the era between Kairi Hojo and Io Shirai at the backbones of the company to the Bushi Road era. She was there in between that sort of, you know, keeping the steady ship, doing everything she could to put on great matches to make things memorable, carrying factions, guiding them to success, guiding them to understanding what it is about wrestling. And yeah, we can look back on 2023. Is she the greatest of all time? No, that's my position. But is she going to be remembered for years and years after this? Absolutely. She's a core part of Stardom's history. She's a core part of um, why people fell in love with Stardom. And I think in many ways that is as important as anything else. You know, the, there's a discussion, you know, that not everyone's made to be world champion. Not every, mm. that's, a, that's a real thing. She didn't need to win the title to win hearts, to win fans over. Uh, she had her place in stardom. She had her place in the company. And it's one that, again, if if Trent's sitting here saying that we're going to remember her, you know, years and years after her career, it's an impact that she made without having to be world champion, without mm-hmm. having to be Wonder of Champion. She didn't need those titles to make an impact. And I think that's a credit ultimately to what career she had and hopefully still has. Again, I'm yeah. not ruling her off but i am probably writing her stardom career off i I just don't see unless she came in for like one match out of nowhere which again would be wonderful Mm. um you never know that it's wrestling you never know i watched cm punk return wwe you never know um and i think that's just the best way to look at it it's enjoy what she did in stardom appreciate what she did enjoy that as a fan and uh, try not to think about the things that she didn't do. Think about the things that she did. There are champions out there, world champions, who will not be remembered anywhere near as well as Jungle Kiona. Um, Jack Swagger, <laughs> for intro- in- instance. <laughs> you could have went from, like, Stardom's history, but that's fine. Uh, Jack Swagger can get thrown under the bus. <laughs> I was not expecting the... Uh, jack swagger comments here on stardom road but here we are folks never know what you're gonna get from this show no you do not but what you can know uh, assuming you're done is that we will be back next episode we will be talking more about jungle kiona we will talk about the best matches of jungle kiona's career and we're going to tell you them right now because we want you to watch them before you we have do. homework ladies and gentlemen who doesn't love some homework? It's five <laughs> matches. We're making it easy for you. You know, it's we could make it difficult, but we're not going. I was going to make it for those last two. I wasn't sure which one to pick. So, oh, all right, it's four. Yeah, because take... we normally do four yeah. for these shows. This isn't me being greedy. This is me not being sure which direction we want to go. Um, but the three that we're definitely doing because I think it's important to set the bar here. We mentioned two of these specifically, so you'll know what's coming. The 5th of March, 2017, Jungle Kiona and Hiroyu Matsumoto versus Kari Hojo and Yoko Bito. All these matches are on Stardom World, by the way. You can watch them legally, properly. Um, the 3rd of March, 2019, Jungle Kiona versus Momo Watanabe for the Wonder of Sun Championship, which Dave, Rel- Dave Meltzer rated 4.5 stars. Back then, that was a big deal because he didn't do stardom regularly. And, of course, the 15th of July, 2019, Jungle Kiona and Konami versus Itami Hashishista and Momo Watanabe. 
The big question, I'm going to let you pick, Scott, because they're both wrestlers that you're very familiar with. Do we go with Jungle Counter versus Kagetsu, the Red Belt match from 2019, or do we go a bit further back into her career and look at the uh, 2017 match, Jungle Counter versus Kari Hojo? I believe the best option here is to go with the Kairi Hojo match. It's first major opportunity, right? It's more back in her old, you know, younger days in the company. I think two matches for 2019, two matches for 2017 kind of gives you the full picture of who she was as a competitor and yep. kind of so build to those big matches. 23rd of February 2017, Jungle Kiona versus Kari Hojo. Those who are long-term listeners of uh, Stardom Road will know this isn't the first match from this particular show that we've told you to go back and watch because it also featured Chris Wolf versus Mai Watani and Getsu for the high-speed title. So there you go. It's a, it's a fun little show. You might as well watch the whole thing, although I don't know if we're going to touch on uh, Shani Baz versus Io Shirai in the future, which was the main event. <sighs> I don't uh I don't plan on it. <laughs> uh but with that, you know, an hour and fifteen minutes in, we always manage to go a little further than we want to. But hey, I know people at home are listening to these months down the road. We appreciate you listening. Make sure to share this show with anyone trying to get into stardom, wanting to know more about stardom. That is why we are here. All of our episodes, they are for the most part, except when I add like very recent comments, they are evergreen for a reason. We want and punks to, coming back every day, people. Yeah, we want to continue to push this show. We want to continue uh, giving people an opportunity to listen and learn because the fun part for us is we sometimes learn new things along the way, and we're we're not here as experts we're here as people doing a podcast and helping educate helping update uh giving you background information that maybe you don't feel like going out of your way to find that is the beauty of the stardom road podcast we go down the road for you and hopefully you come down the road with us uh trent as we wrap up here before we head into part two in two weeks what should the people be looking out for from you? Where can the people follow you and all that jazz? So, as always, you can find me on Twitter slash X at One Up Culture. Uh, this weekend, we have a new Ocean Cyclone show episode dropping. Uh, oh it's the Joshi Auction Draft 2023. <laughs> um, I will not give you spoilers, but I will say uh, it one might of be the... our greatest episode ever. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever wanted to see a man break down on podcasts, check this episode out. I'm not going to tell you which one of yeah. us or Ryan breaks down. I think to listen to it. That's the entertaining part. It's who. Yes. It's yes. <laughs> who and when and what causes said breakdown. So you can check that out uh, on the Wrestle In Podcast Network. Um, I recently released a piece, probably not that recently now, uh, on the IWGP Women's Championship, looking back on its first year of existence. And look, we're getting towards the end of the year, so that means stardom year in review. Uh, both in written form on wrestling and various podcasts. So be sure to check all that stuff out. Yeah. And for me, follow me over on the X at Scotty wrestling on Twitter. I've gotten used to calling it that now, which is very weird. Um, but you know, I think I said, I still think I just said Twitter at the end there. Uh, but you know, it's just, I, I say one thing I say on X Twitter. It's fine. You say um, one thing and mean another, just like absolutely. your podcasting career. Uh, well, you know, um, <laughs> uh, speaking of my podcasting career, you can listen to the Ocean Cyclone show, like you, like Trent said, go back in the archives. That's pretty evergreen for the most part, as well. We have a yeah, lot of shows that's very intentional from us yeah. there. We have a lot of episodes that involve games, drafts, anything imaginable, a lot of angry moments, a lot of fun moments. You don't want to miss that. Uh, you check out Rig Post Radio right here on the Count Up Podcast Network. Our most recent episode was talking about the return of CM Punk to WWE, as I noted earlier, as well as anything with AEW, Stardom's latest updates, and so much more. And then, of course, listen to my weekly Joshi podcast, the Five Star Joshi Show, available everywhere you get your podcasts, which is very, very exciting. Um, 
there's a big show this week. You may have heard of it. The Nagoya, Nagoya Big Winter 2023. Nagoya. Or stardom. <laughs> Timing is everything. Um, that'll be a big show. Looks like the tag titles are going to main event. So that's, that's very exciting. Um, I should have a preview out about that. Probably a review too, written somewhere. And then of course the actual podcast, which is always a hoot. Uh, maybe Trent will be on that. Maybe you won't. You'll have to listen to find out. I have no idea that it was actually just a on the, off the cuff thing. I'm very sorry. Anyways, make sure to tune back in next time as we go over the best some of the best matches of jungle kiona's career make sure you press that subscribe button leave us a five-star review all the spiel that podcasters do that i never actually do because i'm not actually good at that stuff um for trent i'm scott this was the star run podcast here on the Count Out podcast network see ya this has been a count out podcast So, Curtis. Yeah, man. Can Out said we've got to do an ad. I've never done one before. Uh, what should we do? I have no idea, bro. I, I, like, I ever made an ad before. What, what, what do we do an ad for? I don't know. We just say we're like a New Japan Pro Wrestling podcast, and we just put a bunch of clips like here. Arguably the most shredded guy. So yeah. you really want to get there, too. <laughs> uh, I, maybe a little bit bigger. Yeah. We'll see. Heard that here. Michael Richards <laughs> calling Jay White small compared to him. <laughs> <laughs> Here, uh, I love it. This picture you've painted for me, I, I want to hang it up. I want to frame it and hang it up in my in my bedroom. Yeah, we don't have a WWE tryout or a New Japan tryout every second week, and now I'm in Bullet Club. And here, Will Osprey versus Kenny Omega. Do you want to just go off about this match? How do you critique or talk about one of? I think probably the best matches you've ever seen. That's an ad, right? Yeah, yeah, that works. That that that's that's brilliant because then all our work's already been done for us and we don't have to do anything. Aha, past us did it. Present us living in the now. Look at us. Look, Look at, at that. us being friggin' brilliant. Right. Minimum effort, maximum output. Okada Shorts podcast. Check it out on the Count Out Network at Okada Shorts. Rate and subscribe, listen or die.